morning. My name is Brandel, one of the pastors here in Victory Fort. And welcome to 8 a.m. service. Pastor Patrick is not here. Uh, he's on vacation leave right now. So I, I guess, I don't know where he is right now, but he's enjoying right now. So it's, it's um, good that um, he's, he, he has this break for him and his family. How many of you appreciate Pastor Patrick, the labor that he puts in preaching and leading you here? It's really a wonderful sight to see. And um, before that, um, tomorrow we have a big event. Do you know what it is? Election. <laughs> Let's pray for our nation. Let's pray for uh, righteousness, uh, people who would be in place uh, to be the righteous ones, the fear of the Lord, the next generation. Could you pray with me? Uh, Lord, we thank you, God, that you are sovereign over the Philippines. Thank you, God, that you are you you bring the next generation involved in um, in governing our country. We pray for the barangay election. We pray, Lord, for righteousness, and in, in, in not only in the whole election process, but in governance. Lord, we thank you, God, that um, there is uh, hope in every way, God, for for the Philippines, because you are deeply involved in our country. And God, we pray, Lord, for our hearts also that our hearts would love our country and for and friends who are here, for interna internationals who are here, thank you for they are a blessing here. Salamat Panginoon that you're sovereign over our country. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, good morning. I want to introduce my family. Um, before I start, I have to introduce my family to you. I have a picture here of my wife, my beautiful wife, Linny. And my second son, Gavi, the one with the glasses, my eldest, Rafa, and my daughter, Leah. And they enjoyed the, 11, the 8 o'clock service and hope you get to meet them soon here. They're always here in front after a service, so that's my family. And we are now in a week four of our series, What Shapes Us. And um, week one, we talked about God. And the center of that is really the Trinity that we believe that God exists in three persons, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. One in essence, having the same attributes, being, being God, and His attributes and perfections, and um, each person is fully God. And then second week, we talked about creation and the fall. Pastor Patrick beautifully walked us through Genesis, that we are all created by a sovereign God. And He is sovereign over all of His creation. And um, we are made in the image and likeness of God. Can you look at the person next to you? Mukabang image and likeness to God? And the answer is always yes, because we're made in the image and likeness of God. And we're created male and female. And sin brought us um, alienation before God. Apart from God's work, we can never save ourselves. Last week, Pastor Patrick talked about the seed, talked about the whole process in which, in which the seed up to the New Testament, the covenants, and pointing to Jesus, that Jesus is fully human and fully God, and He's the only mediator between God and man. There are no saints that could mediate us. Only Jesus can bridge us to the Father. And He lived a perfect, sinless life, died a perfect death to save the sins of the world. One day, He will come again to judge the living and the dead. This week, we're going to talk about the gospel. And um, let's say, you know, um, in a family dinner or a school reunion, I think we'll be having one this year, uh, in, your, in your high school or a group of friends at the workplace, they know that you're a Christian. Do they know? Of course, right? Am I right? They know that you're a Christian. You're not an undercover Christian. And then um, they would ask you, <clears throat> um, Randall, what is the gospel? And what would be your answer? I guess we have a lot of answers for it. We could say that, um, you know, Jesus died on the cross uh, for our sins. That's one good answer. And... Um, Another person, you, you can say that, you know, Jesus died on the cross so I can go to heaven. And maybe somewhere out there, you slip in John 3.16, a very familiar verse for all of us. And one would be a testimony kind of way. You know, I'm free from my addictions. 
I'm not an alcoholic anymore. I stopped drugs and because Jesus freed me from sin. And um, maybe it's also the life you live now. I live now with joy because um, Jesus is my Savior. Another answer would be, I'm able to change my ways because I'm following Jesus as my priority. And maybe if you don't have an answer, you'd say, you know what? You can go to victory.org.ph <laughs> and um, you can read our statement of faith, <laughs> which is, I'm going to read now um, the gospel. This is our statement of faith. We believe the gospel is the good news that God became man in Jesus Christ to reconcile lost people to himself. He lived a perfect sinless life on our behalf and died on the cross for our sins. He was buried and on the third day rose from the dead, securing our redemption, having triumphed over Satan and the forces of darkness. He ascended into heaven as Lord of all. Everyone who repents and believes in him receives forgiveness of sins and eternal life. That's our statement of faith. You can read that. You can memorize that. And then in that conversation, so okay, I, you read it. It was a good statement of faith. You know, sometimes people are really interested with, with, with your faith. <clears throat> they are really interested on what you believe in. Some ask, what's going to happen if, when I die? And they, they want to know what the gospel is, but they only know snippets of the gospel and not fully understand what the gospel is. And they would ask you, why did Jesus have to die? And they can also ask you, what does it mean to be a Christian who is transformed by the gospel? What did his life on earth accomplish? Why did he have to be human? What did his, what did his death accomplish? <clears throat> and um, how did Jesus' life and death accomplish our salvation? And how do we get saved? What would be our answers? Our text for today, is from 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21. I'd like to invite everyone to stand up as we read scripture together. <clears throat> Verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, the new things have come. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. God, today, as we listen to your word, we stand righteous, not because of our doing, not because of our accomplishments, not because of our last names, not because we have great stature in life, but God, because you, you were made sin for us so that we become, may become your righteousness. Bless the preaching of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. You can now take your seats. Um... Just to give you a background of the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians talk a lot about the issues of the church. So when you read 1 Corinthians, you would see now concerning, now concerning, now concerning. Paul is addressing a lot of issues in the church, which I'm going to share later. 2 Corinthians, there were a lot of people questioning his apostolicity, meaning him being an apostle. He was somehow being backstabbed or being demeaned or being looked down to compared to other apostles. And one of the problems would be factionalism. You know what's factionalism? Sa Tagalog, may faction. Or there is a faction. Factionalism. So the ch there were church issues and they were elevating some leaders. They were elevating some, these people. Looking down on Apostle Paul that um, he was strong in letters but weak in character when they are him and he is there. But um, one of the purpose of the writings is not actually to teach but to defend in 2 Corinthians, but he finds himself explaining the gospel so that the, the church of Corinth will be um, reconciled to God. 
And um, Paul appeals, be reconciled to God. This is the basis, the theology of the cross, why you can be reconciled to God. Verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, the new things have come. When a person is in Christ, when, a, when you receive Jesus as your Lord and your Master, you're part of the new creation. Meaning there is a coming kingdom. There, in a sense that there will be a new heavens and new earth. There will be a new creation, a new Eden. And you're already part of that when you come to Christ. And God's plan of salvation is not just for you and me. It's the whole world. There won't be any pollution anymore. Everything will be made wonderful. And you will be part of that. And when you're part of the new creation, something in us changes, isn't it? Our outlook towards life, the way we view things, there's a certain level of holiness that we walk into. Not perfect, but there's a lens in which something changes. In this verse, the word in Christ is very important for us. It talks about our union with Christ, that we are united with Jesus. And our lives are associated in Jesus. I highlighted the word in Christ there because it's very important for us to understand that our life, your life is associated with Jesus. By the Holy Spirit, not because we have strong faith, not by our doing, and we partake of the saving benefits of what, how God intended our salvation to be. Meaning our union with Christ, all the things that God intended for you to have when Jesus died on the cross, you can have it. So whenever you read the Bible, you see through Christ, for Christ, in Christ, it means it's available for you and me. And in this case, we're saying you have a new identity in Christ. You're no longer your past. You're not defined of your sins before, but you are a new creature in Christ. Can you look at the person next to you? Mukabang creature. Creation, yes. So this is NASB had a different term, but um, we are creations of God. So, so God has bestowed us his identity. And you are a new creation. So what is a new creation? What would be the things that somehow... I would say expected or hopefully we get to live out as a new creation. One is that our hearts are centered on Christ. Second is you are now a child of God. And we're given the grace to renounce all that is ungodly. And we, are, we have a new orientation about life. We are walking in the holiness of God. You are spiritually alive in Christ and you're no longer dead to your sin. That is the picture of being a new creation. And the other side of the passage is the old things. You know what the old things? Anyone here, you know the old things? It's our past. It's um, you are centered on the desires of the flesh. And you and I, were guilty of that. And we love sinning. You know, I'm sinning and I'm loving it. You were like that before, isn't it? If you put someone down because of pride, you bully someone, you feel powerful. That was our heart before. And you don't care about ungodly ways. Before, I feel great. Before, not anymore today. Uh, I feel great if I get to bribe someone and do work my own ways. I feel, wow, worldly wisdom. Wow, I'm, I'm good in the streets. I'm street smart. But in reality, you're fooling people and you're stealing and you're or not stealing, but you are doing unrighteous things. But before we were that, it's cool to disobey. And um, we subscribe to humanistic worldviews. Have you read of The Secret? No? Because it's a secret. <laughs> It's a book that says thoughts become things. Positivity. Just imagine you have this and it will be yours. The power of now. Those feel good when you read it, but they're not true. Jesus is sovereign. 
no matter how hard we think, the illustration in one of the things that I've read before is that think that you'll have a BMW and it will happen. It won't if you won't work. But in that book, just it will become a reality. And it's not biblical, but we love it because we feel in control. And we were dead to our sins. And the next part of the verse says, new things have come. Meaning, any English teacher here, you can correct me after, it's in the present tense, meaning completed action at the present time. That is already who you are. It has happened in the past, but you're still living it now. And meaning, the newness of life is expected of us. I made a table, actually, they made a table for me, or a side-to-side um, illustration of what it means to have the old things and the new creation. In the old things, if it's there, side by side, <laughs> um, we are created, we are centered on the desires of the flesh. On the other side, we center our hearts on Jesus. On the left side, depends where you are right now, the old, old things, we love sinning and we are allies with Satan. Now we are children of God. We do not care about living in ungodly ways before, but now we renounce all ungodliness. We subscribe to a humanistic, secular, flesh-driven worldview, but now we want to know God and His ways and His word. We're dead in our sins and unable to truly love God, but now we are spiritually alive and being able to love God to the fullest. If you look at that side by side and we examine our lives how do you feel about it? Is it the case for all of us? Is it the same case for all of us? Are we able to live out what a new creation truly is? And looking at that table, sometimes you could be feel, feeling condemned about it. You could be feeling unbecoming of a Christian because of the disparity in the table. Verse 18, it says, Now all these things are from God, the new, the new things, who reconciled us to himself. If you look at Paul here, it didn't center on your capacity or on our capacity to be reconciled. The reconciliation comes from God. So it's theocentric, meaning it's God-centered. That God has an eternal plan to bring redemption to the world. And that great plan of salvation is um, the newness of life that comes to God. So my encouragement for all of us in looking at the gospel, we ought not to look at our abilities and limitations, but on God's amazing grace to reconcile us to himself. We are not to take credit for our salvation. It is God who brought you here. It is God who pulled you from the pit. It is God who pulled me out of the life that I lived before. It's God's amazing grace that we need to see. The only basis that the gospel exists is because God reached out to us. God reached out to lost and dead sinners. Who are the lost and dead sinners? Not your boss. <laughs> not your neighbor who sings so loudly in video. Okay. Sometimes we, not the people in the street that you want to, I don't know, the people around you. Sometimes it's easy for us to point fingers on who the lost sinners are. But it's really us, you and me. Also your boss. <laughs> also your neighbor. All of us, we never had a fighting chance to be saved. We never had a fighting chance to truly get to know God. Ephesians 2, 1 to 3 gives us a picture of who we are, <clears throat> who we were, and you were dead in your trespasses and your sins, in which formerly walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, among them too, all formerly lived in the lusts of the flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh, and of the mind were by nature children of wrath, even at the rest, as the rest. So, 
you see this one, and it talks about our past, and it asks us this question, why are you a Christian right now? Why are you enjoying the love of God right now if this is who you were before, who I am before? Why are you truly loving people when before you were prideful? Why are you experiencing this unspeakable joy and peace in having a relationship with Jesus? Verse 4 says it. This is a moment that we all ought to be thankful for. But God. You were dead in your trespasses, but God. Being rich in mercy, with His great love, He loved us. And that's why we are saved. He loves you. He loves your family. He loves your future. Because His love is great and His rich in mercy. He wants you to truly live. Everybody dies. Anyone here? You will die someday. But not everyone truly lives. He wants you and I to be alive in Christ. You could be a dead man walking today. Meaning you're dead. Spiritually dead. But you're alive. Career, success, money, fame, possessions, they won't make you alive. I've done all these vices, all these worldly lifestyles, all, everything. I've tried the world. If some people know me, I've given my testimony for I, I've tried everything. But none of it made me alive. It's truly Jesus who makes us alive. Verse 19, Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against him. He has committed to us to the word of reconciliation. That's the word, reconciliation. Reconciliation assumes that, their, that the relationship is severed or ruptured. And the problem is not with God. The problem is with us. Human sinfulness created a problem. And this sinful condition had to be dealt with. God is holy. He does not want to be associated with sin. He cannot be reconciled with sin. And it cannot be treated lightly. It cannot be swept under the rug. But okay lang. It's okay. It's not okay. The way we have sin in our lives is not okay. God can never be reconciled to sin. And God acted in love to end this hostility of sin in our lives to bring peace. And it's not just a simple word of peace. And you in peace, truce, truce lang tayo, God. <laughs> but there's a mending of relationship. Enemies to children of God, that's where we are. And verse 19, it says here, not counting their trespasses against them. Meaning, this is at the cost of Jesus bearing our sins. John 3.16, a very familiar verse for us. For God so loved the world that he, he gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. So when people ask you, why did Jesus have to die? The answer is to bear God's wrath on sin so that you and I will not bear God's wrath on sin. We are now at peace with God. We are saved and we'll go to heaven when we die. That's good news, right? And we can go to heaven right now. Anyone here? You want to go to heaven right now? <laughs> we all still have to go home. You still be a wife. You still be a husband. You still vote tomorrow. You still face your boss. You still be a sister. You still be a parent. So it would be nice, you know, gospel, I'm saved, and that's it. But the difficult part is, you still have to live out your Christianity. And 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us. Bigat, no? <laughs> God is, a make, is making an appeal through us. Through your life and my life, God is sending us as ambassadors. And this is where it gets difficult. Because Paul's audience were Christian believers. 
calling them to reconcile with God and to represent God to the people. So, you see here Paul's voice in the other part of verse 20. We beg you. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And the issues of the church at that time was sexual immorality. And to Corinthianize is to be, may tulog naman yung bata, no? Um, to Corinthianize is to be a prostitute. They were very into sexual immorality that even they were doing sexual acts that are worse than non-believers. That's why Paul was really admonishing them to reconcile with God. They had relational dysfunction. They had factions. They were centering uh, on religious leaders who were eloquent. And there were also lawsuits among believers. Nagdedemandahan. Nag, they were bringing lawsuits to fellow believers. It's, it's not the way to settle it. You can, you can love each other. That's what Paul is saying. They had worldview problems, meaning they had a secular worldview against the biblical worldview. They, had, they, were, they were contending, what does it mean to be spiritual? What will happen in the resurrection? Greek mythology was a problem for them. Idolatry and pagan worship were the things that we're contending with. They had problems with gender roles. When it comes to church, men, good thing now, before, the culture before that women are second class citizens. But now, it's no longer, we're no Jews or no Gentiles, no male and female, we're all equal. Um, different roles, yes, but it was different before. Marriage, principles of marriage, Paul talks about it. Legalism and Christian freedom. I share that to you because today is the very things that we face. Sexual immorality, relational dysfunction, secular worldview. What's the secular worldview now? Live your truth, relativity, cultural Marxism is what we face today. Wokeism is the things that we face today as opposed to biblical worldview. Gender roles has been more challenging today. Marriage. We have a problem with marriage. We do. <laughs> it's the same problem that we had before. Legalism, Christian freedom is still the same problems that we face today. And what is expected here? Why was he saying, I beg you? What is expected is that the, to abhor the sins that we once loved. In Christ, the sins that we once loved are now the very things that we abhor. The lust of the flesh that you once loved are the things you ought to abhor. Pride that makes you powerful is the one that you have to abhor. In Christ, we can have purity in our se sexual relationships. We can have purity in our relationships, sorry, with your wife and uh, or our husband. We can have purity in our sexuality, male and female. We can be, love can be a reality in our relationship, not pride and power. The problem is that we're still in the flesh. Sin is still a reality. We're not, we're not bond, in bondage, but still a reality. And the backbone of sin, Pastor Patrick shared with us, is in Genesis 3 verse 6. It's something that is good for the food. The light to the eyes. Are, are the verses there? Is it here? Okay. Um, it's there now. So, um, desirable to make one wise. It's the same backbone of sin. The inclination of our hearts. John says it in a different way. It's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And my admonition an encouragement for all of us is that left to ourselves, this will be the same in inclination of our hearts. So preach the gospel to yourself every day. Remember your identity in Christ every day. I'm not this angry person anymore. Power is not what feeds my soul. It's Jesus. Run to God. You know, walk in humility with Him. Because if we choose... To, to let our hearts be influenced by sin, we will domesticate sin. When we say domesticate sin, we lower down the power of sin in our lives. We become friends with our sin. 
we pet our sins. I can hate on people in social media because I am a victim of sin. I can say whatever I want. I can be angry because someone abused me. I am the victim of, I'm a victim of the fall. I'm a sinner. This is who I really am. And this will only change when Jesus returns. This is the thorn in my flesh and I can't do anything about it. We are domesticating sin. You know, sometimes it's practicality. You can't do good business without compromising. It's just a friendly date, a friendly messaging. Or sometimes we steward the sin. We domesticate it, we steward the sin, meaning we use it for God's glory. You know, I steward my sexual preference to help people who are struggling with me. It feels good, it looks good. But are we dealing with the sin? I'll reach out to alcoholics and drug addicts so we can help each other out. In what? <laughs> Jamming, no? Or, or doing drugs together. It's just, it's just sometimes, but we do that. In other ways. Let's pray for that person. Come on, kato kasi nangyari. We gossip in the guise of prayer. I will start a small group who are those addicted like me. And I remember a friend of mine um, told me, you know, I was, a Christ, I was a new Christian then. And you know when you're a new Christian, you're very imposing on others. And my friend said, you know what? Marijuana is from God. What made you say that? Because we have, I don't know what it is, the THC receptors. That's from marijuana, I think. We have THC receptors. So it means God made us to smoke pot. So any receptor that we have, we're allowed. <laughs> and it's just, that's one way of seeing, wow, you really, we, 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 ha- we are experts in justifying sin. And I also have a story a long, long, long time ago. Um, I stumbled upon this page called Christians for Cannabis. Cannabis is marijuana. And I, I won't tell you why I stumbled on that page. But I was looking at the page. They were just reporting people who were caught smoking marijuana. And they saying that all fruit-bearing trees are from God. They're having a pity party on the people who went to jail because they were caught smoking marijuana. It sounds funny. But don't we do that? Don't we justify sometimes our sin and still make ourselves right? We try to domesticate our sins. And one big one, one story I want to share is um, Paul and Angelica. And I asked permission to share this story. And I said that, <clears throat> you know, I don't have to give your names. It could be a, a hypothetical story. But she said, no, no, it's okay. You can mention her names. And gave pictures. <laughs> so... So they really wanted to testify of what God has done in their lives. They were together for a long time. <clears throat> and um, Paul, the guy who was uh, a Christian before Angelica, they were living in. Meaning they're not married, they're living together, living in, um, in sexual immorality. And um, early this year, Angelica got introduced in the church. And um, accepted Jesus as her Lord and Master. Got connected to a community. And um, finished Victory Weekend last April. One of their concerns before Victory Weekend was they were living in. And in them living in, they felt so distant from God. And everyone was just walking with them. They felt there was no peace. We are in church, but we are in sin. They felt unholy because of sin. And then I had a conversation with them. I was in 11 o'clock back then. We had a conversation. They were plugged in a group. People talked to them and encouraged them to separate. And they decided to separate at the very height of their relationship. This This is what Paul said. We are hesitant to separate because of budget constraint. Sobrang limited kami. They were limited at the time, finances, but God provided everything in their marriage. 
And the night before, they separated. They, they were about to separate. They had financial problems at that time. They had to rent another place. They have a wedding to look forward to. But they made a decision. We're going to separate before our wedding. And then, he, and then it's like a moment. Um, they were about to separate and then said, the God who made us decide to separate is the same God who will be with us. So they ended up separating for years. Uh, I mean, se- separating for a few months. But for years, they haven't given her their tithes. They gave their tithes, honored God in everything, and God provided for the wedding. I had the privilege to officiate their wedding last September 22, and now they are married. And that deserves a round of applause, not because, yes, they made a decision, but they made a decision to stop sin. They made a decision even at the cost. There will be a problem with their wedding financially, but God pulled through because they honored God. And it takes faith and courage to say no to sin. And God will show up. Rosario Butterfield is one of the people I listen to when it comes to listening to gender and sexuality. Her book, uh, Holy Sexuality and the Gospel. And she said this, The blood of Christ is never, never makes an ally to the sin that crushes him on the cross. Meaning, we cannot be allies with sin to the very sin that crucified him on the cross. Sin is never your ally. And listening to this, again, you might be feeling condemned. Feeling, wow, God, I'm so far from what you expect me to live out. But here's our comfort. Verses 18 to 20 shows us who the hero is. God, who who reconciled us to himself through Christ, God, was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, God were making an appeal through us on behalf of Christ. God is the initiator of our reconciliation. He did everything. But we have a part to play. To repent. Every day is a day of repentance. Every day is a day to accept that Jesus, I'm not God. You are my Lord. The Westminster's Confession of Faith, written in 1646, um, it's written by pastors and theologians, is one of the most dominant confessions of the faith for Reformed Christianity, it says here, as there is no sin so small, but it deserves damnation. So there is no sin so great that it can bring damnation upon those who truly repent. I will give you a disservice in this preaching if I will not ask all of us to repent from our sins. Turn away from sin that is mastering you right now. Turn away from that pride, lust, whatever it is. Sin will destroy your life. As Paul said it, be reconciled with God. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says here, He made him to be sin who knew no sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So the next question, if your friends ask you, what did his life on earth accomplish? Jesus knew no sin. His substitutionary life, his perfect and sinless life is given to us. He lived a perfect life, a sinless life for you and me. So that because God knows we can never be perfect. We can never do what is right in his eyes. There's a standard of righteousness that we can never reach. So Jesus lived it for us. What did his death accomplish? He made him to be sin on our behalf. His substitutionary death, his perfect death for our sins and the sins of the world. He died on a cross for our sins. He was buried on the third day, rose again, secured our redemption forever. Jesus lived a perfect life and died a perfect death for us so we can be called the righteousness of God. That person next to you is righteous not because of their own doing. I'm righteous. I can confidently say that I'm righteous not because I'm great. 
Because Jesus lived the life that I ought to live. 1 John 4.10, it says here, In this love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be a propitiation for our sins. So, I hope we capture all these theological terms for our sins. Propitiation is a sacrifice that turns aside God's righteous wrath against sin placed on sinners. Meaning, anyone here you like boxing? Okay, ako lang. So, <clears throat> they say you punch a punching bag, not a person. Punch, punching bag? The whole wrath of God on sin was placed on Christ. The whole anger of God was placed on Jesus. Who was supposed to be the punching bag? You and me. So, the appeasement of God's wrath was placed on Jesus. The penalty of sin was placed on Jesus, not you and me. Not in the verse, another theological term. I'm, I hope it helps us. Expiation. The removal of guilt and shame. All the wrath was given to Jesus so that you and I won't experience the wrath and you and I will go out in this world without guilt and, and forgiven. And that's the joy that we can have. Because if you look at our hearts and look at what we did a while ago or last night, we will always be condemned. But we go out there out of shame, out of guilt, because it was removed from us because of Jesus. So you and I are guiltless not because we're great. But God removed it from us because of the work of Christ. So don't be, you're, don't be condemned. God loves you. Jesus made a way. And sometimes this picture gives us a picture that kawawa naman si Jesus. He is not a powerless victim. Critics of Christianity would call it cosmic child abuse. Hebrews 12.2 says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus the author, the perfecter of our faith for the joy that is set before him into the cross. It was a joy for Jesus to die for you and me. He is a willing, sovereign savior, not a martyr. He was raised from the dead. He raised himself up from the dead and he said it in John. So that, Lapitatay Rich, so that, any English teacher here? It's a conjunction. Transitioning from one state to another. Which is our redemption. A sinner is purchased from the slave market of sin by payment of a ransom. Jesus was the ransom to get us out from slavery. Which leads to our justification. An instantaneous judicial act of God in which he considers our sins forgiven and Christ's righteousness belonging to us. Instantaneous. You're righteous because of Jesus. You don't have to, have to, to carry your own cross to be righteous. Because of Jesus, you are righteous. Which leads to what Paul was saying, reconciliation. The reestablishment of relationship between God and man. You bear the righteousness of Christ. You are no longer drenched in the filth of sin that you once lived. I am no longer the brandel who has been ravaged by sin. You're not a damaged good. You're restored in Christ. Because your life, my life, it's hidden in Christ. Last question. How do we get saved? By faith. Ephesians 2 verse 8 to 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not a result of works. So that no one may boast. The gospel is a gift. To be received, not to be earned. We're going to sing song to God. We're going to worship. And I'd like to invite all of us to stand up as we pray. <clears throat> so
some of you here, you're tired of trying to earn God's love. Some of you are tired of trying, forcing yourself to be good so that God might love you more. And I want to pray for us to receive the gospel. You're a Christian, I know, but to receive the gospel. You performed for God in many ways so that He could bless you. That's not the gospel. That's prosperity gospel. I see a picture of a child or was trying to perform before his heavenly, his father. Daddy, look, daddy, look, daddy, look. That's cute. That's good sometimes. But if you think your son or your, your, your daughter is doing that to earn your love, what are you going to do? Son, you don't have to. I love you. You don't have to earn I love you. And I feel some of us, God wants us to experience that. Stop performing. You are loved because of Jesus. You are accepted because of Jesus. And some of us here maybe couldn't couldn't reach out to God. You feel condemned because the sin that's happening in you right now, in your situation, it's the same. Come. I know you've done wrong. I know there's something wrong. Come. Let's mend this relationship. Let's walk together. I want to pray for us. Lord, we thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done on the cross for us. All of us will be wandering souls, not knowing where to find peace, joy, and forgiveness. Or I pray for my brothers and sisters to come. Lay down their lives to you. Not self-preserve. Not be allies with sin. Unburden. Unburden us, God, of trying to perform. Unburden us, God, to be free from our sins. Unburden us, Jesus, to hate sin and to surrender our lives to you. Thank you, Jesus. This is a long walk. But thank you, Jesus, that when it's difficult, you carry us through. When we feel condemned, we can just look at the cross and say, Jesus, thank you. I don't have to be on the cross. I just have to walk with you, receive your gospel, and repent. Thank you, Jesus. Give you all the praise and give you honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all worship the Lord.
response to the gospel that Pastor Randall shared, it's just fitting to partake of communion today. We're going to be reading from uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 26. It says, Therefore I received from the Lord, you're all familiar with this verse, right? But I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night, the same night when he was betrayed, took bread. He didn't take Peter and told him to go after the Judas who betrayed me. He didn't take an exit route. He took bread that symbolizes his body which moments later will be broken for you and me. And that same night you see sin and redemption in one night. You see the breaking of trust, the betrayal, but also the breaking of the body of Christ, the breaking of sin by the breaking of the body of Christ so that we can all partake of it today. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's for you, my broken body, that breaks sin is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after the supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ's body was broken. His blood was shed so you and me can be reunited with God for all of eternity. Let's partake of the communion. Let's, let's partake of the bread. Let's all partake of the cup.
Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that we have this access. We get to look back, look at these symbolisms and know that this stands for all eternity. Nothing can cancel it. That our standing in you, if we're hidden in you, we're justified. We're, we're righteous. It does not matter what we've done in the past. It does not matter what we will end up doing in the future. Our, 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 status, is, our status stands secure. We can always look back and see those symbolisms that we just partook. His body was broken. His blood was shed. So that we can have eternal life with you and we can enjoy it today. Empower us, up, empower us Lord, with your gospel. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Can you all give God a round of applause? Well, you guys are dismissed. If you need prayers, we'll be here in front to help you pray.